Well, good afternoon. God bless you for being here for this fourth hour in a row. I was beginning to wonder if maybe people will be taking a nap at this point, but I am glad that you are here, and I bring you greetings from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, where it is a balmy 52 degrees right now. <laughs> and it was a little dicey getting up here yesterday. I was beginning to wonder if I was going to get to be here, but I'm grateful to be here. And uh, if, if you're coming to Minneapolis, which this happens to be my first time ever to Minneapolis, believe it or not. Why not come when there's like record setting cold? This is great. Like, I don't want to come up here and people go, how was it? Well, it was 40 degrees. No, snow. So it's going to be minus 30 on Wednesday, I think it is. So great. Wonderful. We're inside. We're in ignorant bliss. Um, I was born and raised in suburban Detroit. So Bloomfield Hills, Michigan area, if anybody hails from there. So I've seen all the snow I need to ever see in my whole life. And my parents came home one day and told my brother and me when I was in the seventh grade that we were moving. So really, where are we moving? We're moving to South Florida. And we went to a condominium on the beach. And uh, it's like we were living the dream until we found out they have schools in South Florida and we were not on a perpetual vacation. But uh, goodbye to all the snow and toboggans and sleds and ice skating and all of that. But uh, at any rate, I am thrilled to be here with you and to be talking about a subject that is dear to me. And I think I saw my book was under the lectern just a minute ago, but I wanted to kind of correct that it's not forthcoming, it's here. And I'm very glad that it's here and I'll be doing a book signing right after this session and would love to meet any of you there that, that can come by. But have you noticed how easy it is for us to be self-absorbed? We take for granted who God is and what he has done. Now, we're believers in Christ. We owe our very existence to him. We're grateful. We know we're supposed to be grateful. We read the scriptures as we, as, as we know we ought. We study them. We're, we meditate upon them. We seek to memorize them. We seek to be women of the word who are, are women after God's own heart. We, we read scripture and, and we're able to, to understand that the plain thing's the main thing and the main thing's the plain thing, right? And one of the very plain things is that we are supposed to be grateful people. We don't have to be biblical scholars to understand that. We can read in the Psalms over and over again, praise the Lord, praise the Lord with thanksgiving, praise the Lord with your whole heart, praise the Lord forever. In the New Testament, we read about giving thanks in all circumstances and walking with the Lord abounding in thanksgiving. So what's the big deal? This is not controversial, right? Okay, so there's not going to be another seminar where someone comes in and is like, that stuff that you heard about gratitude, you know, it's iffy. Where are you on the gratitude question? I mean, there's, there's none of that. We understand <laughs> we're supposed to be grateful. So, so why are we making a big deal about it, this? Let's just all resolve, okay, she's right. We probably aren't grateful enough. Let's do a better job, okay? Let's be more intentional about it. Let's count our blessings, name them one by one. Let's reach out to others and be more grateful to people in our own homes and in our own churches. And, and, and let's even write a thank you note every once in a while. That'd be revolutionary. And, and, and you know, do we really need 45 minutes on this? Um, th this? This is just not that big of a deal. Well, I would say that it's not that simple. And so my whole premise is that, that gratitude is a rich theological issue. And when gratitude becomes rote and simplistic and one of those check the box mentality kind of issues, and even can become somewhat boring to people, that's when we have a big problem. True gratitude is a sense of awe that the creator of the universe, who is infinite in all of his perfections, has sent his sinless son to save us. He knows us, he loves us, and we're to be grateful. We're surrounded by unbelievers who don't know anything about the gratitude that we have to God as we understand it, but they often live with somewhat of an opposite mentality that we see just oozing out everywhere, and that's the entitlement mentality, where so many people live with this mentality that they deserve all the best that life has to offer. And this is nothing new. We need to not look far in Scripture. In fact, it's at the very beginning in Genesis 3 where we read about, as you well know, this story where the serpent, who's more crafty than any other beast, says to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of that tree? And so when the woman saw the tree was good for food and was a delight to her eyes and she, the tree was to be desired, she took and ate and gave some to her husband. So, so here they are in the paradise of Eden. They are in the Garden of Eden. Things are perfect. They are literally perfect, okay? And, and all is well, and they can eat of any tree of the garden except for one tree. But that's not good enough. Oh, would that they would have just been satisfied for what had been given versus wanting more. But therefore, ingratitude is thus at the root of original sin way back in the garden that resulted in the fall. 
when we look at the New Testament and Paul's very sobering first chapter of Romans that we read where he talks about the wrath of God being revealed to the sons of disobedience and, and perhaps one of the most terrifying phrases in all of scripture when he says several times, and God gave them over, and God gave them over. Well, why did he do that? Uh, for two reasons that we read in, in verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So that's a pretty big deal, right? They became futile in their thinking. Their fool, foolish hearts were dark, and claiming to be wise, they became fools, and God gave them over. Later, Paul writes to us in some of the last words that we have recorded from him right before his, his death, and he writes in 2 Timothy 3, talking about a whole list of things that characterize godlessness in the last days. He says, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless. He names off 10 other things. And then he says, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. So ingratitude, being ungrateful is included in that list. And these are just three passages that are a sampling of, of what we could use to link ingratitude to sin. So going to a, a quote from my favorite, uh, my personal favorite theologian, theologian and cultural commentator of this age, among other things, R. Albert Moeller, says this on his website. And I quote, we need to recognize that gratitude is a deeply theological act when it's rightly understood. As a matter of fact, thankfulness is theology in microcosm. You come to understand an entire system of theology an entire set of doctrines and beliefs by what the Christian believes about gratitude. And thus, this is key to our understanding about what we really believe about God, what we really believe about ourselves, and what we really believe about the world we experience. So clearly, gratitude is worthy of our attention, and it should be a hallmark of our lives. I've got lots of quotes to share with you in this brief time we have together from believers who are a lot smarter than I am and are practicing this and modeling it well. And of course, we will have lots of scripture as our ultimate guide. So as we get ready to, to jump into that, join me in prayer. Father, we're grateful that we get to now think about gratitude. I pray that you would focus our thoughts and our minds to your glory alone as we're ever mindful of the unspeakable gift of salvation to us in Christ alone. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So I want to talk to you um, about a couple things that are quite technical even. And I know this is the fourth hour, so just please hang with me because I want to read to you a couple of quotes so that I don't try to paraphrase them. And, and the most technical one is from that great early American theologian, uh, and Pastor Jonathan Edwards. And he has aptly described what he calls two levels of gratitude. And I found his, his classification to be very helpful as we consider what gratitude means for the believer in Christ. So in his work qual called Religious Affections, he said this, and I quote, There is a certain gratitude that is a mere natural thing. Gratitude is one of the natural affections of the soul of man. Gratitude is an affection one has towards another for loving him or gratifying him. There is doubtless such a thing as gracious gratitude, which does differ greatly from all that gratitude which natural men experience. It differs in the following respects. True gratitude or thankfulness to God for his kindness to us arises from a foundation laid before of love of God for what he is in himself Whereas a natural gratitude has no such antecedent foundation. Nothing has come before it. The gracious stirrings of grateful affection to God for kindness received always are from a stock of love already in the heart, established in the first place on other grounds. Something else is included, and another love paves the way and lays the foundation for these grateful affections. End quote. So when we, th we think about this one, we read in Psalm 118, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. In that verse, we are thanking him for he is good. That's talking about who he is. It says nothing about what he's done, but it's all about his character and who he is. Back to Jonathan Edwards, quote, In a gracious gratitude, men are affected with the attribute of God's goodness and free grace, not only as they are concerned in it, or as it affects their interest,
but as a part of the glory and beauty of God's nature. That wonderful and unparalleled grace of God, which is manifested in the work of redemption and shines forth in the face of Jesus Christ, is infinitely glorious in itself, end quote. Okay, let's unpack this explanation just a little bit. We, we rightly show gratitude to God when we enumerate his blessings to us that are undeserved and so greatly appreciated. So that's certainly true. That's the natural gratitude that Edwards refers to. We do enumerate the many, many ways that he blesses us on a daily basis. We do remember to thank him for answered prayer. But Edwards' point is when we do this, we are expressing that natural affection that is conditional. Dr. John Piper reflected on Edwards' writings and said this, quote, And God is not glorified if the foundation of our gratitude is the worth of the gift and not the excellency of the giver. If gratitude is not rooted in the beauty of God before the gift, it is probably disguised idolatry. May God grant us a heart to delight in him for who he is, so that all our gratitude for his gifts will be the echo of our joy in the excellency of the giver, end quote. So I thought that was very helpful in explaining Edwards, but this helps me further when I think of it this way. We've all, we've all um, seen, maybe you've had sons who have done this, who've met the love of their lives, and they've decided that this girl is the one, and so they go out and spend every last dime they ever had, maybe some they don't have yet, and they're borrowing money, and they're getting this ring, and, and nowadays you can't just give the girl the ring, you have to orchestrate a whole big thing with video stuff and all that. So anyway, he's bought the ring, he's got his words memorized that's going to just spill out of him with all sincerity. Sincerity. He's got sweaty palms, the whole thing. He, he, this event finally comes. He drops to his knee after he has said these things, and he opens the box, and his would-be wife, future wife, just absolutely is astounded with the beauty of this ring. And so he puts it on her finger, and he's immediately relieved that, okay, I did, I did well. It's a good thing. If she didn't like this, this is a big deal. I've spent so much money on it. But she loves the cut, she loves the clarity, she loves the carrots, she loves all the C's about this jewelry, and, and so she's great, 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 so she's got it on. Well, she just won't stop talking about it. So he keeps waiting for her to say something else, like, okay, the ring is beautiful, and, you know, and pour out her heart about how this is the man of her dreams, but it doesn't happen. And they, I mean, how weird would it be if they then go to talk to the parents and the family and everybody's happy for them and all she can do is go, this ring, can you believe the ring? It's just, look, look at it from this angle, this angle, this angle. That guy would be nuts to marry her. All he knows about her is that she appreciates his taste in jewelry, right? But he doesn't know anything about what she thinks about him. And that is somewhat a poor example, but it maybe helps us put a little bit of light on what Edwards is trying to say. When all we do is thank God for all the things he's given us, but we just jump right past and never come back to who he is. And the fact that the gifts he gives us don't make us want to be thankful to them, to him in and of themselves. We are first and foremost thankful to God for who he is. Chuck Colson was another one that helped, helped um, kind of clarify Edwards' concept when he said this. He said, the gracious gratitude for who God is also goes to the heart of who we are in Christ. It's relational rather than conditional. Though our world may shatter, we are secure in him. The fount of our joy, the love of the God who made us and saved us cannot be quenched by any power that exists, Romans 8. People who are filled with such radical gratitude are unstoppable, irrepressible, overflowing with what C.S. Lewis called the good infection, the supernatural, refreshing love of God that draws others to him, end quote. Okay, so this is what we want, ladies. This is what we want to possess. The natural gratitude that Edwards calls it is a genuine, frequent appreciation to the Lord for, for his blessings, but it's not likely to be prevalent when things go wrong. Uh, And one more quote from Chuck Colson, he said, that kind of gratitude can't buoy us in difficult times, nor does it by itself truly please God. And to paraphrase Jesus, even pagans can give thanks when things are going well. So we rightly express both types of thanks to the Lord, but I think it's helpful to note that by itself, that natural gratitude on its own does not even please God. Gracious gratitude is what should spring up as that constant fountain that we're ever mindful of, God's character and his attributes. We read about that that abounding um, fountain in Colossians 2, 6, and 7. We'll come back to that again. 
When we sincerely express this kind, we show clear evidence of sanctification, by the way, and the presence of the Holy Spirit within. So here's a nice little byproduct for those of you who may, uh, Satan may plague you with doubt about whether you're truly a believer or not. If you, if you are praising God for his holiness, um, you don't need to worry that you're not in the sanctification process. Because lost people might thank God, you know, one of those, I didn't get in a wreck, oh, thank you, God, in case you're up there, in case there is a God and he's listening, thank you. Uh, they aren't going to randomly just say, thanks, God, that you're holy. All right? that, that doesn't happen. So, so that's just a nice, sweet byproduct that we get. Um, also remember that gratitude is not a spiritual discipline like Bible intake or prayer or fasting or meditation. And it's not something that we can put on our to-do list as just a task. You know, be more grateful, check the box. It is instead a virtue. It is an affection that has to be cultivated. Here's another great quote from G.K. Chesterton. Very succinctly, he says it this way. Thanks are the highest form of thought, and gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Thanks are the highest form of thought, end quote. So this, again, I'm telling you, this is a big deal. Some advocate having blessing journals, so we won't take the time to go over the different kinds of ways that, that you can um, enumerate your thanks to God. I will just stand here and tell you that since I've learned about this type of gratitude, my, the way that I praise the Lord is just completely different than it was. I have a, have a praise list in my prayer notebook, and it started with you know things listing off my salvation, first of all, and my Christian home and all these things. Those, all that stuff that's so vitally important and I'm so thankful for, that's all gotten pushed way down the list and vaulted up to the top of the list are the fact that God's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's sovereign, he's infinite in all of his perfections. All these things that we will never be, that he always is, we praise him for that first and foremost. And then we add to that his other attributes that as image bearers of God, we hope to be able to develop and to cultivate. And we're told to be holy as he is holy. We, we're commanded to be loving and patient and long-suffering and all of those things that he always is. And so that's where I want my praise to him to begin every time I praise the Lord with that gracious gratitude. So however you want to do that, whatever form you want to use, you want to have an app for it or some kind of list on your phone, uh, go ahead. I won't go off on a tangent, but I do prefer. I have a paper planner. That's a whole thing I teach my student wives about, getting ready to do that in Louisville tomorrow. Um, but I also just, I, I love having just a paper um, system that I use for prayer requests and praises and all of that. It is spiritually healthy for us to be specific as we thank the Lord about his daily provisions, and of course, it is biblical. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so if all of that is true, you know, again, we could go to dinner early if we just ended up here, but I have to just ask the question, if all of that is true, and I believe it is, and I don't think anyone's arguing that, why is it that as believers we just are so lax in this area? And so I have come up with what I consider to be four big obstacles to gratitude. Your four may be different than mine. That's fine. I wrote the book that I put these four in. I'm glad for you to write another book and put four other ones in there. Um, but, but I think in a room this size, there are going to be at least several people who will fall into each one of these categories. So we're going to run through uh, these four obstacles and some biblical ways to counter them. The first one may be one that you may not come up with if given a, a long time to, to come up with reasons, but I think some people struggle with gratitude, not for the difficult circumstances that they personally have or that they know will come as a result of, of life, but they struggle with gratitude and peace related to the rejection of the gospel by those they love. And it's just overwhelming, and it's just hard for them to be able to fully praise the Lord when they think about being in paradise with him forever without those loved ones. They would sooner uh, face a, a life-threatening disease because they're certain of the safety of the fact that their own life is hidden with Christ in God forever. But the, the physically healthy but spiritually dead people in their lives overwhelm their thoughts and interfere with gracious gratitude. So Psalm 111.1 and Psalm 9.1 both say, I will give thanks with my whole heart. And that's a struggle for them because they want to be grateful. They love the Lord with all of their heart, but this is why they're torn. Now we see through a glass dimly and we want to hurry up the results, don't we? We just want to be in control. We just want to, to fix it. And particularly when we want to fix that, we long for lost people to come to Christ. And we know that he is at work in his own timetable. I recently heard an amazing story that was just an encouragement to me on this particular topic, and it's about a family with seven children, and only the father was a believer, and by the time he died, one of his children was a believer. So he died and left behind this one son in an unbelieving family. 
And so that son just continued to live out the gospel in front of that family and was just so burdened as he's the only one who trusts Christ. So for some reason, which I'm sure was from the Holy Spirit, he went to a Christian friend and said, I've made a recording of my testimony, and I want to give this to you, and you just hold on to it. He says, if anything should ever happen to me, play this at, the, at my funeral. Maybe, maybe even when I'm gone, it could have some kind of an effect. So the guy thought that was kind of weird, but he did it, and he kept it. And guess what? The man was in a plane crash. He was not the pilot of the plane. He was a passenger in a plane crash. He died. That recording was played at his funeral. And five of his siblings and their families, as well as his own wife, his children, and his own mother were transformed by the gospel and came to faith in Jesus Christ. There's only one brother, to my knowledge, this is still the case, who has not come to faith in Christ. But one of the brothers uh, was a medical doctor, his wife also a medical doctor. They shuttered their practices. They moved to the Dominican Republic. Some of you know Dr. Miguel Nunez and his wife Kathy. This is his story. Uh, can you imagine what, what kind of an ecstatically glad reunion there's going to be in heaven, in glory, when that earthly family is reunited? That brother sowed seeds and did not, see, did not live to see them sprout, but in God's perfect timing, they burst forth and they continue to bear fruit. The uh, Anglican pastor from the 19th century, Charles Bridges, said this, and it's, it totally sounds like an Anglican pastor in the 19th century, so, but it sticks with you. He said this, The seed may lie under the clods till we lie there and then spring up. That was the case for this brother. I mean, and this may be the case for us, those of us who have children who are not walking with the Lord, and it's just such a burden to mothers' hearts and to fathers' hearts as well. But the seeds may lie under the clods until we too are under the clods and we too are dead from, from our life on this earth. And then in God's perfect timing, they will spring up. This again forces us to realize we are not in control and we are so very limited in our knowledge and what God is doing and will do in the hearts of men. This enhances our ability to show God gratitude for his character of omniscience, that he knows everything. We have to place our trust in him daily and keep on praying uh, as, as we read in Colossians 3, for that peace of Christ to rule in our hearts. I mean, keep, don't just pray that. Don't just read it and move on. You've got to go back, and sometimes we've got to just keep praying it until we believe it. Just keep praying it until the Lord truly causes that to, to reign in our hearts. We don't do this so that we can beg God to somehow change his mind, but to change us as we grow closer to him and deepen our relationship. Do you ever marvel by the fact just by the way, that we're not only commanded to pray, but we have the privilege to pray. The God of the universe wants to hear from us, from you and me and everyone in this room. So we continue to pray and we continue to express gratitude to God for his perfect plan. I put on my resource list the book Prayer for Prodigals, which I recommend to any of you who have, um, have children or family members that are not walking with the Lord, and it's just scripture saturated. I don't need another book that's got you know a lot of advice. I wanted one that was just scripturally uh, based that I could recommend, and this one you can just keep praying through it. 90 days, just keep going over and over it again. Also in my prayer journal, I just have a list, sadly. Now I just have a list that's called a prodigal list. And every time I, I meet with people and talk to people whose child's not praying, not walking with the Lord, I want to get that child's name. And I am praying uh, many times through tears for that child who knows the truth, who was raised in a home where Christ was exalted, that that, that, that child will come back to the Lord. We can meditate for this particular obstacle on Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. A second obstacle, which is completely different than the first one, but it may be one that Satan really uses, is, is when we're just so distracted with busyness and self-focus that our spiritual growth is stunted by our schedule, and we relegate gratitude instead of exalt it. So we can look to the story recorded um, in Luke 17 when Jesus healed the 10 lepers, and you know this well, and they have this horrible dread disease, and they're running away, and as they're going away, they are cleansed, and, and only one turns around and comes back to show gratitude to the Lord. Now, we could take this apart many different ways, and many faithful pastors have preached through this passage, and, and, and you know, we want to think that we'd be the one that went back, right? You know, if this was us, I'd, I'd be the one, I'd be one that, that turned around and went back, but... Um, Today, how many allow Satan to distract them with busyness and seemingly important tasks that our minds are just 
otherwise occupied with things that we just don't seem to have time for anything except quickly praying over our food. And just, you know, and I don't mean that you need to spend 30 minutes while the food's getting cold thanking God for the wheat and every different part of the ingredients of the meal. But, but, you know, it's almost the mentality that like, well, he knows we're thankful, right? I thanked him yesterday for breakfast and now for lunch and dinner. And, um, but our, per- our personal spiritual disciplines can get relegated to the bottom of the list. And, um, you know, we're looking for a quick passage of scripture to read that's got some kind of inspirational nugget to get us through the day. And, 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 and we've been cured by something so worse than the horrors of leprosy. That's what's just amazing. We were dead in our trespasses and sins and separated hopelessly from God. Now, we could get defensive, and busy people often do, and they start telling everybody how busy they are doing good things. We see this in ministry all the time. Do you have any idea what I've been doing? Do you have any idea how many hours I've spent on this and this and this? I'm here to personally stop the glorification of busy, okay? I don't care how many children you have involved in how many different sports and activities and and good things related to your church ministry. Um, We have to just be busy. We just have to be rather honest enough to admit when we're just too busy or purely self-absorbed. So we can meditate on Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 that says, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Nothing in that verse converse, connotes anything about a rushed, oh yeah, thank you God. So we, we think about that, and I think all of us can be guilty of this at one point or another. A third hindrance possibly to gratitude may be that we have fallen into the sin of taking for granted the unspeakable gift that we've been given and our joy is not what it should be. Instead, we've been, been bogged down by envy and discontent in our personal circumstances. Now, we only can walk in our own shoes. I fully realize that. We don't, do not know the half of what some people bear from physical to emotional to economic burdens. We heard in, in one of the seminars this afternoon how, how, how this couple just kept this under the radar because they didn't want anyone to know about it, but it's, it's, it's a thorn in the flesh for sure that's constantly present. It's a struggle every day for people to push through and be grateful to God for who he is as well as what he's been given. Well, I'm not here to minimize that. I'm not here at all to, to, to talk down towards people that are dealing with that. But I would just point you to Paul who had that thorn in the flesh that we're so well aware of. We don't know what it was. Uh, I think it's better maybe that we don't know what it was because we can take whatever thorn is sticking us or someone we love and imagine that maybe that's even what Paul had. In First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12 is one of the places where Paul mentions it. I heard an excellent sermon on this particular passage preached by Dr. Heath Lambert in the Southern Seminary Chapel not long ago, and I thought he made such an excellent point that I will paraphrase for you here. He said, Paul was arguably the greatest Christian who ever lived. The Holy Spirit inspired him to write so much of the New Testament such that we rightly devour his words centuries later. He had a short life on earth to accomplish so much. Wouldn't he, of all people, been able to thrive had he not been afflicted with that thorn, whatever it was? Well, apparently not. Because three times he asked the Lord to take it away and three times he did not. Therefore, our infinitely wise and omnipotent God determined that the Apostle Paul should not be relieved of this great difficulty. Therefore, we should not question our own thorns, but continue to pray for relief and trust God in all things. If he did not remove Paul's thorn, it may be that he's not going to remove ours either. We will understand it all in glory. And again, I know this is so much easier to say uh, as I stand before you as someone who's not suffering from a chronic disease or, or, or chronic issue. And, and, but, you know, every day is a gift. We have no idea what tomorrow will bring. It's almost like we are looking at a map and we, and, and we say, Lord, you know, if I could just go down this road over here, this looks so much safer and simpler and easier and convenient, but the Lord directs us down a different road. And that road looks long and it looks treacherous. But when we get to heaven, won't it be amazing to see that the people that we met and the things that we did and the lessons that we learned on that road that we walked were exactly what we needed to do. And it was exactly the right road for us. So sometimes when we get bogged down with this particular obstacle, we need a wake-up call to remind ourselves that we were bought with a price. No matter what our thorn is, we are blood-bought children of the king. We never let the wonder of that be taken for granted. It's beyond words how amazing that is, and it defies any explanation as to why we are not living a life filled with gracious gratitude to God in spite of the thorns. 
Now, I spent one chapter in, in my book on each one of these obstacles, and then I added another chapter after that that's just called Thanking God When It Hurts because I felt like we needed further explanation of, of it's almost counterintuitive to say, now, are you really telling us to be thankful for these obstacles? Um, so in the chapter, as part of the chapter, I quote um, George Matheson, who was a hymn writer who wrote the old hymn, Oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Some of you will know that it's just a beautiful hymn that talks about how great and gracious and kind and wonderful the Lord is. Um, there's a similar story. There's lots of great hymn stories. Some of you are, are familiar with these. But um, now thank we all our God, which is the hymn we often sing at Thanksgiving time that has such powerful words of thanksgiving in it. Uh, with hearts and hands and voices whose wondrous things have done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way. And that's just to keep us in his grace, guide us when perplexed. I read parts of that quickly and then tell you that this, this about the, the one who wrote this was Martin Rinkert. And he wrote this because his wife had starved to death in order to give what little food they had to their children. He wrote this song so that his children would not doubt the goodness of God during these hard times. The man who wrote, Oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go, was blind at the age of 20, had an extremely difficult life. So, so what I would put out here is, you know, if, if, if these things were to happen to us, would we today sit down and write a hymn about it? I don't know that we would. Some of you might. But I, I don't think it's so audacious then to suggest that we thank God for the thorns. And, and not in any kind of a weirdo like, oh, dear God, thank you that I'm plagued with this disease or this circumstance. But to look for, for what the Lord is doing through this. Um, George Matheson, the man who wrote A Love That Will Not Let Me Go, prayed this, this beautiful prayer. I'll read a part of it. He said, My God, I have never thanked thee for the thorns. I have thanked thee a thousand times for my roses, but never once for my thorns. Teach me the glory of the cross I bear. Teach me the value of the thorns. Show me that I have climbed closer to thee along the path of pain. Show me that through my tears, the colors of your rainbow look much more brilliant. And again, I remind you that's written by a man who's blind. And he's talking about the richness of the rainbow. So uh, in this chapter, I hope it's helpful. I gave 10 different ways that we can thank the Lord for the thorn. So whether it's thanking him because whether we escape or endure this affliction, the Lord is, our life is forever hidden with Christ and God. And I give a scripture with each one of these. We can thank the Lord for the thorn because he's teaching us an important lesson in this process that we wouldn't have learned otherwise. We can thank him because um, the dependence that we have on him during this grief is, takes away any thought we have of self-reliance. So, so hopefully that is helpful. But I hope that, that many of you who, who have this um, particular obstacle that you would admit to is, is impairing your gratitude, that, that you would be one who just gladly prays scripture. Do you do that? Um, Dr. Don Whitney's written a wonderful book called Praying the Psalms. He's one of our spiritual uh, formation professors and and it's just it's so simple to do this and it takes care of the issue of when when you're at wit's end and you just keep saying the same things over and over again and you feel like your prayer life is just really stymied start praying back the words of scripture to the lord go to the psalms uh, go, go to psalm 51 if, if you're going through the, a particular season create in me a clean heart O god renew a right spirit within me cast me not from your presence take not your holy spirit from me Restore to me the joy of my salvation, of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. So I know this is hard to do, but the Lord is, is aware of all this, and this will be a balm to your soul like no other when you pray the words of the Lord back to him with all sincerity. So quickly, a fourth possible hindrance may be that you allow, allow doubt to plague you. So you don't know me. I sort of mentioned a minute ago that the Lord um, called me to himself at an early age. I was born uh, into a Christian home with godly Christian parents, and my life has just been one blessing upon another. Of course, there have been things along the way that have grown me and stretched me and shaped me, but, but I've never had any disaster befall me, and I praise the Lord for that, that I've never been tempted to stray off the path. I've never had to um, you know, wander off and then come back and, and return to the church, but the Lord has just blessed me every single step of the way, and, and I just praise him that I didn't have to go through so many things that so many others do. But let me also stress that I was just as lost and hopelessly unable to save myself as the worst uh, sinner. So um, that goes without saying. But there are others who have had a, just a really rough life before they came to faith in Christ. They, there are many shameful acts that, that happened. Um, and, and they have sometimes trouble realizing that God has called themselves 
called himself to them and saved him forever, that you're a new creation. And Satan tries to convince you that you should still carry some guilt from those old days. The scars and the life circumstances that result from your life before Christ are in the forefront of your mind, whether it's sexual immorality, abortion, maybe an outright rejection of God. This is spiritual warfare, so let's just call it what it is. This is Satan wanting to convince you that, that you really are not um, called to the Lord and, and you're not safe in his care forever. But it's an insult to the gospel to live with even a hint of an attitude that the righteousness of Christ is not enough to cover your sin. But that's really what you're saying when you doubt. As believers, we stand before God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. God the Father looks at each of us through the lens of Christ's substitutionary death on the cross. And when he sees us, he is satisfied. We are justified. We are redeemed. We're in the process of sanctification. We're awaiting glorification. It's just as if we never sinned. Do you believe that? Every single one of us who has been saved should, should realize that and should resolve to have a life of grateful gratitude until he comes. So several verses that you can ponder, or passages you can ponder if this happens to be your obstacle. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul gives a long list of vices. And then he says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. And then that beautiful benediction in Jude, we read, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. So those are the four hindrances quickly, and I wanted to, to um, now just kind of wrap up with a little bit of some practical application. We, you know, there's, it's said that gratitude is the parent virtue, meaning that it begets growth in other virtues. So if you grow in gratitude, perhaps you will grow in patience and in joy, for example, so we can hope that that is true. But it's important for us to show gratitude to those around us and to encourage other believers and to be a witness to other believers as well. So back to Colossians 2, 6, 7, which is kind of my anchor for, for this talk. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now, Greek scholars tell us that that word means overflowing. So we think of it this way. When you bump into us as believers, gratitude should spill out of us. Isn't that a great word picture? We're, we're overflowing with it. It's not that we've just got a little bit of gratitude down in there somewhere because we're thankful. We got the love of Jesus down in our heart. You know, that great song that we, that we like to sing, where uh, down in my heart to stay. Well, it's supposed to be bubbling up. And it's supposed to be if you bump into us, gratitude spills out. I, I love that. Now, the world says this about gratitude, as coined by the ancient philosopher Tacitus. He says, men are more ready to repay an injury than a benefit, because gratitude is a burden and revenge is a pleasure. Okay, this is coming from a secular philosopher, but is there truth in that? Gratitude's a burden and revenge is a pleasure? So, so when we're wronged, even slightly cut off in traffic or something, are we more likely to react than when some, someone does something kind? We never want to have the attitude that gratitude is a burden. So let's talk about a few practical ways that we can show that. First of all, um, gratitude begins at home. So we would start there with talking about what a privilege it is for those of us who are married to be able to show genuine gratitude to our spouses. And so, so ladies, our, our husbands need to hear from us beyond the occasional greeting card, um, you know, Father's Day anniversary, whatever, or the verbal thank you. They need to know uh, in deliberate and regular ways that we are grateful for them. It's one thing if a man's boss, co-workers, friends, fellow church members show gratitude for what he does, but he wants to hear from you, his wife. Uh, that you note simple acts of kindness in addition to his love and his leadership and his protection and his provision. He never tires of hearing that. And I'm afraid it's all too easy for us to let him, us to let husbands know things we don't appreciate and we neglect the things that we do. One of my favorite Elizabeth Elliot quotes is actually from, um, she's actually quoting her second husband, Lars Gren, who said this, that if a wife is very generous, she may allow that her husband lives up to 80% of her expectations. There's always the other 20% that she would like to change, and she may chip away at it for the whole of their married life without reducing it very much. She, on the other hand, may simply decide to enjoy the 80%, and both of them will be happy. 
It's a down-to-earth illustration of a principle. Accept positively and actively what is given to you. Let thanksgiving be the habit of your life. There's a great tweet. There, I mean, it's just right there. Let thanksgiving be the habit of your life. So, so it begins at home. Uh, a second way we could practically apply this is that common courtesy is an expression of gratitude in its most basic form. Have, have you noticed, as I have, that please and thank you are just going away and that people just kind of grunt at each other or maybe say nothing? So I try to be very intentional with, with clerks or with wait staff or whatever, of making eye contact and just simply saying please when I need something or thank you when something is delivered. Uh, that's just very basic, but sometimes you see in their eye that they're surprised that you have said that. Uh, you can make someone's day by just simply saying thank you. I noticed how you did such a fine job and, you know, in, in this convention center. If there's a, someone in there cleaning the bathrooms, God love them. That's an honest job that they're doing. I wouldn't want that for anything, but it's a job and they're doing it well. So, I mean, what would it mean for you to just go, thank you so much, you're doing a fine job today. That, that's, that's gratitude in, in practice. Well, what about modeling it for your children? We could spend a whole lot of time on this, um, and those sweet little innocent children just start out so cute and sweet, and I've got two little grandsons now, and I won't even start going off on them because um, my husband and I, if you follow him at all on social media, we passed obnoxious a long time ago, and now that we have a second one, you know, we're just off the charts. But I saw this on Twitter one day, and I just laughed out loud. It said this, a five-year-old is just some chocolate milk and a crazy straw away from the best day ever. <laughs> now, is that not true for a five-year-old? It's true for our little three-year-old grandson. We take him to McDonald's for ice cream, and it's ice cream day, and he's just so excited and happy, and it's the best day ever. But those same children, if they're not careful, and if their parents are not intentional, as my dear daughter and son-in-law are, of raising those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, they grow up with an entitlement mentality. And it's no longer the best day ever unless they've got the iPhone 10 because somebody over here has got the iPhone 10 and they should deserve that. And so the entitlement mentality will run rampant if we're not careful. So we teach them at an early age that every gift we have comes from the Lord. I spent a little bit of time on this in the book and I joked about it in the opening that thank you in writing, this would be another practical way, is not passe. I don't know who decided out there somewhere that thank you notes have gone away. You know, I'm not a dinosaur yet. I'm a grandmother, but I'm not a dinosaur. And they do still sell them. And it is still a way for us to, in an uninterrupted, uninterrupted way show gratitude in writing to people for something they've done whether it's a gift they've gone to the trouble to buy and send to us whether it's a meal they've prepared whether it's something that they don't even know we notice that we take the time to just say thank you for your service in doing this I noted it the Lord was honored in this that's that's a great way for us to show gratitude and we can do that we can all be about doing that well Okay, I got to wrap this up because there's clapping next door. That means we're getting to the end. So let's see what I'm going to skip here and um, get to the end very quickly. So I want you to take away from this short seminar that as believers in Christ, we want to think about gratitude in its primary form as an affection that we have welling up within us in our meager attempts to appreciate who God is and what he has done. And then it's that whole happiness doubled by wonder. Uh, beyond that, it's a secondary affection, right? It's that secondary affection that causes us to not only count our blessings and praise the Lord for them, but also to show others gratitude as well. Here's one other quick one as we feed on God's word in 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul's just real quick with these mandates. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay, whole books are written about how to find the will of God. Paul's given it to us in three quick sound bites here. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. He doesn't say for all circumstances. He says give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Satan does not want us to be people filled with gratitude at all, so we do have to be mindful that it is indeed spiritual warfare when we are not filled with gratitude. And he reminds us of this in the end of, of chapter 5, his closing, his closing words at the end of 1 Peter 5. He says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, 
knowing that the same kind of suffering is being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be glory and dominion now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time together, and I pray that you will indeed help us to, to seek to show you, Lord, gracious gratitude every single day of our lives until we see you face to face when we know that we will get to then bring you glorious gratitude forever and eternity. Father, help us to show natural gratitude as well and to do it in spite of the unique obstacles that we face. Help us to embrace those thorns, Lord, knowing that it will all make perfect sense one day. And Lord, let us show gratitude to each, to each other as it spills out from us in an abundance. And we will give you all the glory in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.